Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to TAFAF Afternoons. Very excited to have you here. This is a, sort of an inaugural day because we've only had TAFAF coffee talks in the morning, so we're expanding the program into afternoons. And it's very exciting to have this particular panel to be part of that inauguration. How's that? Um, we have a wonderful panel today on a very exciting and timely subject and a, a great number of experts. I will introduce the moderator, but I am, and she will introduce the rest of the panel. Before I do that, I'd like to put a plug in for the cultural brochure so that you have a look at other things that are going on for the rest of the week because there are a lot of really interesting conversations uh, on a wide variety of topics. Um, this is being live streamed, so you will be able to find it on Facebook and then thereafter, once it's edited, it'll go up on the website in perpetuity. <laughs> so, and eventually into the Met. And eventually into the Met, yes, exactly. <laughs> But these are such rich and wonderful conversations that actually, you know, you may either go back to them yourself or recommend them to others, and that would be fantastic. So right now, I will introduce, without a doubt, the hero of the day, <laughs> who is Megan Daly. As you may see in your brochure, uh, uh, Tim McCall was supposed to be moderating today, and he has come down very ill in Philadelphia and couldn't be here. So Megan, in really a moment of great triumph, has decided, has agreed to step in for us. So we're so happy, delighted to have her. She's a writer and editor, contributed to various art publications, too numerous to name, but we're so happy she's here. Take it away, Megan. All right. No, I am not. <laughs> I'm not uh, Timothy McCall, but uh, I, have, uh, I have had the pleasure of editing Jonquil's work um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, fashion and style and the symbolism of, of those things in master paintings uh, that she has so brilliantly brought to life in her articles for Sotheby's, Christie's, Vanity Fair, and elsewhere. And uh, we're here to talk about the, the renaissance of renaissance fashion uh, in current fashion. And it's appropriate um, to Tefaf, obviously, because of um, the material that is on view. And last night, Jonquil and I walked around and looked at a lot of portraits and had a lot of fun pointing out, uh, with listening to Jonk will talk about uh, very easily knowing all of the history of practically every portrait on every stand about what the person was wearing and what it That's meant. That's really generous, and, definitely <laughs> <laughs> And how much it cost. Uh, so what, you know, it's, and as, as your, your article um, in Vanity Fair said that, uh, you know, there is this kind of sudden fascination with uh, the old masters from, in, you know, from uh, Louis Vuitton and Alexander McQueen and, of course, Gucci, which we'll, we'll get to. Uh, but what, what are some of the, um, with those, and what are some of the other uh, designers? Yeah? Oh, I should introduce everyone. That's right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is Jonquil O'Reilly. She is <laughs> a vice president at Christie's New York and a specialist in old master paintings. Amelia Diamond is the head of creative at Man Repeller, which is what? Can you tell us about Man Repeller? Oh, yes. I was like, maybe it's on there, so I don't it's have to not. do the whole spiel. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a media site that uh, started with a belief that um, fashion or an interest in it doesn't minimize one's intellect, but we also sort of talk about fashion as and style as a greater means of exploration and often transcends literal style or fashion into um, all the various metaphors that you can think of. And Rachel Tastian, who is the fashion news editor of Garage magazine, can you tell us about that publication? Yeah, so Garage um, 
is an art and fashion magazine. Um, it's a biannual publication that also has a website. Um, and uh, we really deal with the intersection of fashion and style and how designers and artists work together. Great. OK, so <laughs> back to my question about you know, where we can see this, um, specifically this uh, historically inspired trend in recent collections and which designers are you seeing doing this in a particularly interesting way? Well, I think um, I know I'm biased because every uh, every collection I look at, I see you know um, uh, pointed bodice waists. I see um, you know the wide flared hips of um, uh, of you know, sort of Velasquez paintings, and I see you know powdered wigs. I I, I know on on the one hand you do see what you want to see. But in the last five years, I really do think it's, it's been coming to the fore. And it, when I first started writing about it, I was writing about uh, fashion in paintings just as a way to get people to look and to give people a sort of in that was a bit more democratic. Um, and so I would pull out with, with you, I would you know, we'd pull out um, current fashion. And it was really just as a way, when we first talked about it, it was so that when people flicked through the magazine, we knew if we just had old masters in there, people would keep flicking past. But as soon as you put a fashion image in there, people would stop and, and actually look at it. So um, in the beginning, it was really hard to look anywhere other than at McQueen, because I always saw the, the most historical references in Alexander McQueen's clothing. And um, so that, that was where it started, but I think from then, the last couple of years, more and more designers have been either inadvertently, but I, I don't believe it can possibly all be inadvertent, or you know, very specifically looking at period fashion um, at, you know, across all different centuries um, uh, for their inspiration. And, I mean, both of you can probably speak to, to which designers more, because you spend your time actually at the, <laughs> at the runway shows. With your work, I, I'm thinking, um, you know, what Jonkel was referring to stories that she would do um, under the rubric of the costumist, where she would um, focus on a particular sartorial element in old master paintings, discuss its significance, and then look at contemporary ways that it was being used. So that's why McQueen would often come up, for instance, um, with um, your story on the rough. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not really something that might may or may not translate into the everyday. No, not not at all. I no. can't imagine anyone that would work. <laughs> depending, on, depending on who you are and yes. <laughs> what you can pull off. But but it was fun, and it wasn't hard actually to see um, the abundance of references uh, in in recent collections. Um, you know, from the past few years and even beyond. Um, with McQueen being being there, but also um, Louis Vuitton, which which um, Amelia was talking about. Um, can you talk about what we were saying about the waistcoats a little bit and what you've noticed about this trend? Yeah, well, I think that there's sort of two interesting things that's that are happening when we look at the the Renaissance of Renaissance fashion um, in modern day fashion, and one of which is the um, sort of reconsideration of power. And what that means. So, for example, Nicola Gasquier's, I think, fall, spring or fall 2018 collection featured those waistcoats and, um, and overcoats that were typically worn by men, as you wrote. Um, but today they're made for women. But today, even made for women kind of begs the question well, what does that mean? If, you know, gender fluidity is so much part of the conversation, we're about to reach a point in fashion in general, I think, where you know um, women's collections or men's collections are going to kind of become irrelevant. Um, people wear what they want to wear either way. So, um, but just on that point, we were talking about how uh, typically men would be often more ostentatiously dressed in, and we looked at some of the portraits last night, there is that. <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's always my favorite subject because um, historically men and women uh, both dressed very flamboyantly and you're, it wasn't sort of considered to be peacocking or um, uh, being a dandy. The idea of the dandy didn't actually come in until the 19th century, um, but it was, it was really a way of showing who you were and what you could afford to wear. So 
Um, it was it was very important that you you know both husband and wife in their matching portraits, for example, would be you know, would be looking fantastic. And you see that as you go around the fair, um, you'll see that in portrait after portrait, these exquisite textiles and these you know, wonderful shapes. Um, and it it just sort of stopped in the 19th century, and men started to wear much more um, conservative clothing. And you know the the suit became you know the the, the sort of one and only garment for for men, you know the formal garment for men. And instead, they would display their wealth and power by how they could dress the women on their arm. And I think that's that's carried on today. But I, I I'm actually interested to know, you know, are, have you been seeing a, a, a sort of rise in um, in in sort of more ostentatious, more um, uh, interesting clothing for men. Yeah, well, that's interesting actually when you were talking about the sort of, um, the reason why this kind of fashion emerged was in order to capture it in a portrait. And I think it's important to point out that this clothing emerged at the same time as the kind of like, um, development of Instagram. Mm. So in a certain way, an Instagram can function in the same way that an old master portrait might have functioned. I mean, I was even reading last week that there's this new social media trend that I think began in Russia and has also now moved to China where someone pretends that they have fallen over and they display all of their Chanel and Gucci bags in their <laughs> cell phone <laughs> case. And, and it's really about this ostentatious showing of your Oops. belongings, and, um, <laughs> which is very similar to showing off the kind of intricacy of a brocaded piece of fabric. Yes. Um, and I think the other thing that I was thinking about is, as Amelia was talking about Gasquier, is that, you know, with someone like McQueen, um, you know, that sort of those shapes like the rough and, you know, those like ruffles in general, the kind of tightened bodice is something that's intrinsic to British fashion. And so I think he was really kind of playing with a lot of those historical tropes to reinvent um, them. Yeah, like you know, Super Tudor. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and to sort of bring them to a modern audience that, um, you know, was perhaps more concerned with having their nose buried in British Vogue than with, you know, um, visiting the National Portrait Gallery mm. at that point. Um, but now, when you see, I think, these kinds of things like the frock coat at Gesquier or even um, Gucci, which I know we're going to touch on later, you really see it emerging with the most kind of forward thinking and modern trends in fashion. So with Gesquier, those frock coats were shown with little um, boxer briefs, and they were shown with a sneaker that is like one of the like it basically sold out as soon as the sneaker was in stores like you had to be on a waiting list to get the sneaker so it's interesting that the the frock coat which is you know from here up this is very kind of it looks like you know an old master portrait but from the waist down you know it's like some really cool kid walking around soho um and you see the same thing in gucci is that you know they're kind of interpreting Again, these brocaded fabrics and this like a lot of embellishment and that sort of thing, but it's happening on sneakers and it's happening on sweatsuits. So I just, you know, I know that's a lot to throw out there, but I was just thinking all of that as you guys were talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are, I mean, those are kinds of the, those are the brands where I'm seeing it. And again, especially, I think it really is not to be too cynical about it, but I really do think it is tied to Instagram and that clothing. I mean, it just really, and like the man repeller Instagram is like, one of the most followed fashion Instagrams. It's like one of the first things that I look up, I look at in the morning as a fashion person. And you can really see that. I mean, they're really like these elegantly staged portraits of what people mm. are wearing. And that clothing just like really pops, like even on a tiny phone. Yeah. So, yeah. But can you talk a little bit about how those, about the Instagram? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, you sort of said something funny when you were speaking about the top half is, you know, looks very formal and the bottom half is, were literally boxer shorts and sneakers. Um, although I thought your point was very funny that also in that same outfit were these little alien like <laughs> sunglasses and it was pointed out that that would look fantastic with a powdered wig. Um, but I mean, so I think that sort of speaks to what a lot of designers are doing. And there are, there are some designers today who are doing full gowns that look like they could be out of any of these portraits. Full gowns with zero irony, like Mark Carrion, who's a very young designer. Um, Simone Rocha, who it's just pure opulence and bows and frills and uh, volume and petticoats. And, um, but I think the designers who are sort of mixing the high-low, um, it speaks to two things, both that high-low thing, that idea of like, now you can sort of, I don't think 
most people can save up for a Louis Vuitton coat, but you can save up for a piece, right? And you can wear that with your boxer shorts, your vintage tank top, your, you know, like there's sort of a mixing of pieces, sort of if you look the way that we're all dressed, they're, you're incorporating one item at a time rather than buying your entire definition of self for one portrait, right? Um, it also sort of makes me think of how people, we kind of joke about how they dress up for a, a Skype call today. You know, <laughs> most people at work so remotely that there's like a joke that you like put on your blazer and your tie, but like you might not have pants on. So I but think- Which I think could possibly be the same in some of these portraits. I mean, yeah. so many of them are bus length. Right. I mean, how right. do we know yeah, what no, they were? Yeah. Uh, Slippers but, on and- well, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. The ice cream down there. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, just, I think it's really interesting you know, what you're saying about how people you know, stage their and continue to stage their Instagram portraits. I mean, these these mid sort of, you know Renaissance portraits and going through to you know up to the 18th century, it, you have that similar thing of these people sort of you know they might be um, particularly in the, the early Renaissance portraits where all you're really seeing is someone's head and to try and bring you into the picture frame a bit, they might sort of perch their fingers on the edge, but sometimes they'll make sure that they're holding a ring. And she's like, uh, you, should, you should know that I also own this. And also this is really expensive and I've got all my chains up to here. And, and so it's, you know, it's that same thing of like, whoops, I dropped everything from my Chanel handbag on the floor. It's like, oh, can you fit the clock in the background as well? Because I've got a clock now. Um, right, and my, <laughs> my groomsman and my pony yeah. as like, well. From, a woman yeah, pinning, pinning my through. Yeah. <laughs> so it is that it is similar to the to the Instagram of this sort of oops, you know, and um, and thinking of couples dressing up grandly. Um, in your story, you talk about uh, Beyonce and Jay Z and how they yes. <laughs> took over the Louvre, which was a power move of a of a very particular kind, mm -hmm. and the two of them and how they present themselves uh, to the world via Instagram and in that video. And how, and I'm just thinking about what um, Rachel said about the sneakers and things, and and the video being a sort of um, mass uh, dissemination of these works to you know a huge group of people who may never go to the Louvre or not even know what these paintings are, but maybe have a sense of what they mean or signify that they have a kind of power to them. Mm -hmm. Um, which is really interesting, but also then how, how mainstream can we really expect some of these things to be? Or is it, is it really about like, the, is the brocade sneaker enough um, to kind of get that look? Or, you know, is it, is it really about just the one piece? And otherwise there is a kind of costumey element to it. Um, and how, how do you, do you, both of you also see maybe some of the runway looks really um, coming into reality in terms of what people are wearing. Well, um, I think to the first point that you were talking about with the Jay-Z and Beyonce video, I think in part a lot of this is about a shift in what we consider the canon um, of art in general and who belongs in that kind of museum setting, what kind of art you know, um, warrants a place. Um, uh, and it should be the kind of thing that like everyone recognizes no matter where it is. And I think that like Jay-Z and Beyonce were sort of staking their place in that canon. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's in part what that video was about. And I think also um, that you see with, you know, and this sort of gets into the second part of the question, you usually don't see someone wearing the full head to toe Gucci, but you do see those pieces. And again, I think it's what Amelia was pointing to with this kind of mixture of high and low is that it isn't necessarily that you know a certain kind of person anymore wears or deserves to wear Louis Vuitton or Gucci. Um, I think there's now this understanding that those brands are, um, or there's a hope that those brands are really for a much larger audience than the kind of immediate you know Paris or Europe-based buyer. Yeah. Whereas I think in in, in the portraits that I look at there were very, very fixed rules about who was allowed to wear what. And so you, know, we, you find that you know, only a person of a, a, cer at a certain level in society is allowed to wear specific brocades. So if you're wearing, um, uh, I see <laughs> textile collector in the, in the foreground here nodding. <laughs> uh, <there are laughs> certain, um, uh, certain textiles, like there's one called um, uh, 
tish, gold tissue and cloth of gold. And these are textiles that are woven with real um, precious metal threads. And you were only allowed to wear, in England, um, uh, Henry VIII, for example, uh, put in uh, a, what's called a sumptuary law, which is a, you know, a law to do with you know, what you can spend on, um, on luxury items. And it said that you were only allowed to wear um, a cloth of gold tissue, which is this sort of um, boucle effect, um, if you were actually a member of his immediate family. So you have wonderful portraits <laughs> um, of, uh, it was because it was his favorite fabric, in fact. Um, uh, there's a wonderful portrait of Elizabeth I, his daughter, as um, a young woman. And it's when her, um, where, I'm trying to think where, uh, which wife was still alive at this point, but she had been shunned because she was, um, uh, so she was Catholic. She was Catholic. No, Mary was Catholic. She was, which one, which, yes, no. Uh, <laughs> British, I should really get my monarchy down before I start talking about it. I really should have, think, reviewed, think. should have reviewed that Habsburg should chart. Have, really I don't know what, done. who should have um, But she had been sort of pushed to one side because um, Mary was terrified that she would go, come and, you know, uh, stake a claim to the throne. Um, and uh, so when she sat for her portrait, she made a big point of wearing these huge sleeves that are all in this um, gold boucle. And that's obviously a clear statement is, don't you even dare try and say that I'm not a part of this family, because I am. <laughs> and, and I've got the sleeves to prove it. And so, but we, uh, now, we, um, uh, I will, I, what a statement I'm making with my sleeves. Well. Uh, <laughs> for a very important family. Um, uh, no, it's, it, it's interesting that now fashion has become, so, or supposedly become so much more democratic, but realistically, it's about what you can afford rather than necessarily what sort of, um, whether you're a lord or a princess or whatever. Um, but I really enjoy the fact that you, know, you, you get high street knockoffs, but it's not just, I, I find that fashion now um, is, you, you can much more easily find ways of, uh, of following that don't necessarily mean buying the high street knockoff. And you know, if you can't afford to save for certain things, you can find you know, old things in vintage shops and that's okay. And you can cobble together things um, that you know, perhaps before wouldn't have been as acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just also about, I mean, this is a very common recent conversation in fashion, though not a common, or though not a recent complaint. It's like an ages old complaint, but just sort of about visual representation in fashion and let alone who can participate in buying it, like who's seeing themselves in it, both, you know, race, gender, sexuality, religion, body. Like for one time, it was very one white, tall, thin note. Um, and so, though I think that, runway optics or um, campaign optics are very much just a small and perhaps insignificant tip of the iceberg in terms of representation and what that means. Um, I think the ability of who is in these clothes um, says a lot more. I mean, it says a, it says a ton. Um, I think seeing, you know, so I think seeing, again, what you were saying, changing who's part of that canon, like Beyonce and Jay-Z mm -hmm. in the middle of, you know, the Louvre kind of declaring and taking up space. That's just a common word right now. So when we see different people of different races or backgrounds drawn into a Gucci representation of with like a, an Elizabethan collar, it sort of reshifts again the power dynamic, the um, the ability of who gets to see themselves in the fantasy. Mm. I think that so much of fashion is a fantasy, but to be able to participate in the, fa in the fantasy, maybe that's sort of what is being democratized or what is trying to be better democratized. Like, I don't think pats on the backs are relevant, but um, I think if you look at Gucci's Instagram account for beauty that's dedicated to, right. it's, it's all these fantastic, if you, I think it's like Gucci underscore beauty if you have time to look at it, but it's dedicated to you all these. You have time, go and look at it. <laughs> so like Magnificent paintings um, from, you know, I guess sort of what's considered the old masters era. And I'm sure that he has uh, widened the, the time period that yeah. might technically fall within that, but it's, it's, it's a lot white, but you can tell that there are searches for other references in art that are not. And I think that that alone, 
what it, you know, it well, and plays into beauty. And there's that. also, um, as a part of that kind of Instagram account, there's currently this filter um, on Instagram that is was built and sponsored by Gucci, uh, onto which your face is dropped into an old master portrait. Um, and you can press to get different filters and it will put this huge wig on you and there's a little scroll with, um, I think they're dragonflies holding um, in studs the word Guccify. Um, <laughs> that's that's so, literally gonna be the rest of your afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Just putting yourself in these. Like, that, you, um, you all will look really good in powdered wigs. <laughs> so cool. But yeah, it's, it's, it's showing uh, you can participate in this, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's sort of the thing, stick mm -hmm. your face here. I think yeah. that's so cool. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Andro, uh, Alessandro Michele, the uh, Gucci uh, creative director who took over a few years ago and how um, he really has transformed that brand again in a way. And I was just thinking about uh, how beauty is uh, and beauty products are another accessible way for people to get into a brand. You know, you can get a lipstick, um, but maybe you know not a garment. Um, and what what is what is it about you know and and the kind of um, influence now that Gucci has on that aesthetic? If hopefully people know um, what we mean, you know, it's a sort of um, androgynous looking person wearing. 70s, you know, purple tinted glasses that you're with Elizabeth the first wig, right? And with this long, um, you know, sort of old masterish gown, which could be from any variety of centuries. Um, what is it about that aesthetic that is so appealing now? Because there seems to be this kind of frenzy um, of excitement about Gucci, about Alessandro, and about just the visuals of, of the whole, not just the clothes, but the campaign itself. And what, what, is, what is it that, that um, is so compelling about that, do you think? I you mean, guys we, can each answer that. We were just talking about this before we were mic'd, but I think it's about maximalism and um, a response to, you know, norm core and the jeans and all of us walking around in athleisure. Um, I think that there's just sort of like a push of like, again, back to the fantasy, back to playing with elegance, and but bringing that to reality too. Yeah. And also if you just think about the way that um, fashion trends tend to like emerge and expire, there had been for this long period of time, um, this sort of dominant minimalist aesthetic that Jill Saunders had started and Raph Simmons had continued and that Phoebe Philo had then sort of perfected at Celine. Um, and she had started at Celine in about 2009. So by the time Gucci, by the time Alessandro took the helm at Gucci, which I think was in 2014 or 15, it had been at five years of people wearing pretty minimalist, um, you know, muted colors, um, you know, maybe like cool big earrings, but it was a pretty kind of subtle look that was the dominating aesthetic. Even if you look at fast fashion, you know, that's really the time at which Zara um, and H&M became such, you know, huge companies was because it's pretty easy to knock off a garment like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so I think people were really ready for a kind of different, um, you know, mood. And Alessandro was actually like, you know, I'm sure you guys know this, but um, uh, he was actually working at Gucci for a long time, I think in the accessories department. Um, and, you know, they had had a very kind of, um, again, like sort of a minimalist, but a little bit sexier than, you know, what Phoebe Philo was doing. But again, that kind of like minimalist and kind of all black, um, aesthetic and he really was able to just reinvigorate uh, fashion in a way that you know was just so different from what anyone had been doing for the previous several years um, but also I just you know no one had really been doing that kind of maximalist fashion since like the 80s I mean the, when you like think about when the last time that had happened like which is another age of money and excess <laughs> yeah. and I mean I think in fashion ubiquity sort of takes over no matter what is trending um, suddenly everyone sort of looks like everyone else if you if you look at, if you identify like the narrow people of those who are following it but you can look out on the street and everyone kind of suddenly looks the same and that is happening, I think, a bit with the Gucci effect. Suddenly everything looks quite Gucci. Um, but I think what was initially sort of shocking or refreshing about that, like first, like Alessandro Michel, like his like first hyper, hyper layered sweaters, you know, big geeky glasses, knits, everything paired collection with the brocade and whatever. 
I think what was interesting to me about it was that it was so layered and so styled that any person could look at it and restyle it on themselves and look completely different and yeah, look from like themselves. a charity shop, from like, the, 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 right. exactly. I mean, not that I try it all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't work. But sometimes, yeah, it does. I, I think, yeah, that um, having, being able to build it from pieces that you yourself can buy at any other, at any level means that then it, it will be really easy because you make, um, in a way you make it ugly and ugly is interesting right. rather than you know um, traditionally attractive. Um, I think what I've been finding so fascinating about Alessandro Michele is that he with you know his sort of takeover of Gucci he has he's brought this strange uniformity to the brand that's you know going right across to beauty as you said you know when you scroll down they just launched this new Instagram account and when you scroll to the bottom it's you know I, I was looking I was like oh great you know this is, oh, this is great look at this old master aesthetic oh that is an old master oh wait this is not this is not master this is not master and then I realized they just they launched their account just with old master paintings and 19th century paintings and so to see that he's he's bringing that culture to the entire brand you know he's got these um uh uh, there's a, a new thing out at the moment. They're doing a collaboration with Cabana magazine, and they're doing Gucci collects. And they're always, and again, it's very powered, you know, for Instagram because you can now follow hashtags on Instagram. And so you, fo you follow you know, hashtag Cabana and Gucci, or you fo follow you know, Gucci collects, and you can see these sort of strange collections of items. He's obviously so fascinated by you know by this idea of collecting and. It's, I, I think it's, it's been wonderful because you're seeing it you know, not just in the clothes, not just in the beauty, but also in the way that he is, um, he's pushing the brand. So the, um, you know, the, uh, the publicity that you see, the right, fashion just, shoots. Um, lifestyle of eclecticism, like, you know, you want him, him to fall over with his bag. You want to see what's yeah, in exactly. his yeah, bag. Yeah, I want to like, see what's in that bag. You know, what, like, Butterflies in amber, and, you know, <laughs> exactly. a crown, and you know, a tiny marble bust. Yeah. And who knows? You know, all kinds of things. Absolutely, I think he's also what uh, what I've really, really enjoyed is seeing these. Um, instead of doing the traditional fashion shoot, um, that they've been getting um, illustrations instead, and they had this uh, this um, uh, illustrator called Ignacio Monreal. Thanks for the Google earlier, Amelia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he's been um, creating these almost, um, almost lifelike uh, illustrations of um, you know, models wearing Gucci, but then recreating um, the sort of poses and, um, uh, and, and sort of settings of old master paintings. So they did um, Gucci in the uh, um, uh, in the garden, the Gucci garden, and they had um, you know, the two main figures were standing really sort of stiffly and holding hands, and it was made to look like uh, Jan van Eyck's portrait in the National Gallery in London, uh, the Arnolfini portrait, which you would recognise. The, they sort of look a bit alien-like, and she's got a big green dress on, she's holding it at the front, and everyone thinks she's pregnant, she's not pregnant, it's just a really heavy fabric. You can read about that yourself. Um, uh, you've got that, but they also placed it in the, um, you know, in Bosch, uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of, of Earthly Delights, which is this huge triptych, you'd recognize it, you know, even if you weren't an old master person, you know, from all the strange creatures. And they, all of these strange creatures, instead of being weird dragons or um, you know, heads that are attached to just bums with trumpets coming out of them, or lizards that are eating fish, that are eating people, but they have legs. Instead, you've got all these sort of strange creatures, but wearing Gucci. And, and so it's, it's really fun that he's, he's made it just, he's just created this entire Gucci old master world. I'm in it. Well, and I think it's trickled even, I mean, it might be a jump to say that he's, he's contributed to the full trickle, but I think there's some truth to the fact that we're even seeing it now, you know, um, the, the cover of T Magazine with Maya Rudolph was painted or mm -hmm. rend I think it was painted or rendered to look exactly like a painting yeah. and there was the Vogue cover um, yes, right, the Jennifer John Lawrence Curran, yeah uh, painting yeah right. Jennifer Lawrence and it looked like a Parmigianino it looked like a Parmigianino right and now and there was just there was one other instance that I can't think of but um oh uh, New York Magazine they just had a whole their their fashion issue the whole spread was 
modern fashion, but redone by painters. Um, and so I just think that there is sort of like a, a pullback into that appreciation. And I, and I sort of think some of it stems from his obsession with art and sort of mm. that the decadent time of art, you know, not just the hyper minimalist. Well, and I think also, you know, fashion from fashion is very paranoid about people thinking that it's a frivolous business or a frivolous interest. And I think any time that it can sort of assert its um, more serious side in a way that is commercially beneficial, that is extremely interesting um, to the fashion industry. So that's, for example, why the Met Gala has become such an over the top, you know, event at the scale of the Oscars um, is that, you know, it allows fashion to sort of assert its relationships to these, um, you know, industries that may typically seem more, you know, meaningful or intellectually rich. Mm, and the same, you know, art loves the fashion industry. It gives a kind of luster. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting and long uh, term kind of mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship between these things and yes. we were also talking about how um, even uh, if not in the clothes or the marketing just uh, in Victoria Beckham's shop in London how she had old master paintings hanging in there and it gives this you know is it that it gives a kind of authority in a way right to to the fashion and and to the designer as sort of having a kind of highbrow knowledge even though it can be quite playful as we were saying especially with gucci and it in a way it doesn't take itself too seriously a lot of the time but but i wonder if you think that it means that the paintings themselves will be come better known or will interest do you think is this is it really going to go back to the art how does it how does it affect how people see the art? Is there suddenly going to be, you know, a blockbuster of, um, you know, Dutch? I, I, I think there has to be. I mean, I think, you know, with the rise of people writing so much about fashion and old master paintings, <laughs> doing panel discussions, uh, <laughs> organizing exhibitions. Right. Um, no, I think, I think. I mean, if Jay Z and Beyonce sponsor. Yeah, can we just get Jay Z and Beyonce to come? In? No, I think, I, I think it, it, it is getting people to look more. And I think that these, you know, there has been criticism of these, you sort of, um, does fashion belong in museums and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. If you're getting people to look, that is the important thing. And I think the old guard are gradually sort of being pushed aside. Those who said, oh, well, this is frivolous and people should, you know, people should have a proper knowledge of art history. And they, you know, they, well, if they don't understand them, that's their problem. I think if you're encouraging people to look and you're making it more democratic, then all the better. And I think the more we encourage um, people to look and the more that we are, um, approachable and make the subject matter appealing, um, the, more, the more people will find it interesting and the more people will, will return to paintings and return to museums to look at, mm -hmm. to look at paintings more. And I, I think that's what's, what's great and fun about what, and important about what you're doing. And also that you know, fashion doesn't belong in the museum, but fashion was already in the museum, is, yes. is the thing. It's, it's been there all along. And, and what, what you do is, um, is show how kind of not stiff and overly serious a lot of these paintings are. They have these kind of really, um, dare we say, even sexy little symbols in them Absolutely. of like a flash of clothing being opened and it's pink or red or something. And, Just have um, a look, yeah, as you you're know, going around. If we you walk a around. Around. <laughs> If you walk around the fair, there, there are a few instances of this. Well, and I also think that kind of, um, that has encouraged people to look at contemporary fashion in the way that you look at uh, clothing in portraits. For example, if you think about when Melania Trump wore that Gucci blouse, the pink pussy bow blouse, the way that people were discussing um, and interrogating what she was wearing and why is very similar to the way that you look at and write about clothing. And I think the way that the Man Repeller covers clothing every day. That's interesting. That's that's quite true. You know, what is it? What is the symbolism of this bow right now yeah. in this moment? What does it mean? And you know, it doesn't take five hundred years for us to get around to looking at mm -hmm. it because it's immediately out there, and there is this kind of ease with which everyone can comment on it. Um, so yes, that. Uh, speaking of comments, shall we open it up to questions for our panelists? Yes. Um, the gentleman in the back. Okay, yes. Um, I was curious, um, particularly John Quill, we're speaking on a week where um, Calvin Klein actually just opened up 
um, at their space on the bottom floor over on 39th Street, the uh, a series by Andy Warhol, The Shadows, and and um, they're also sponsoring. Um, I believe the Andy Warhol exhibition that's going to open at the Whitney soon. And I was curious if you thought why Gucci hasn't taken that step or why we're not seeing brands taking that step and kind of promoting the actual exhibitions and seeing um, kind of that effect to promote these old masters paintings. Well, we, um, we actually have Gucci specifically um, sponsored the, um, uh, the exhibition um, at Chatsworth House Style, which was um, curated by Hamish Bowles and Lady Burlington, who's the daughter-in-law of the of the Duke, um, and uh, they uh, sort of you know, brought a much more. It had originally been historical fashion, and what they did was take lots of, of the gowns from um, uh, from Debo, the Duchess, and um, and and mix those with lots of. Um, uh, the sort of more historical garments, you know, be it sort of uh, um, uh, Order of the Garter worn by the by the knights, you know, when the Duke was knight, um, uh, the sort of um, christening clothes of all of these different you know members of the aristocracy, and and Gucci wove in. They in fact, in fact designed um, a gown, one for the current Duchess, and um, one for Lady Burlington, who you know is the next Duchess in line. Neither of which could be worn, really, but they were looking at sort of historical references from, from the wardrobes there already. So they, they have already started to do that. In fact, they were the, the major donors for, for that exhibition. And I suspect we'll be seeing more. I think that you know, they do want to hitch themselves to that, to that wagon and, and have the, the sort of gravitas of the art. And the art wants the, the sort of fashionableness of, of fashion. Hi. Um, you know, I was just thinking as you were speaking, um, I remember hearing in the news a few years ago, I don't remember the specifics, but there were Italian fashion houses that were taking um, ownership in, in, you know, fountains and monuments and um, maintaining their own cities and environments. Um, and, you know, thinking about art education these days, um, classical art education and kind of like the French Academy style has been having a bit of a resurgence. Do you think that um, what you're seeing in fashion is just coincidence in terms of um, kind of a, a cyclical trend, or do you think that there's really kind of a, um, a theme of like looking back to move forward? Who's that question for? Oh, sorry, just in general. I don't know if that's a that's kind of a general question, I suppose. Do I think? If, well, I th I mean, I do think it's all cyclical, I, but I think it dep I think that the cycle. It will be interesting to see if the cycle is sped up because of the sort of digital age and the, fa the, the fact that we get sick of everything so much more quickly, um, or if it sort of breathes new life into things. And I mean, maybe, maybe both at the same time. I, I mean, I think what's super interesting, what your question made me think about is if a resurgence, um, you know, as you were sort of saying in this like style of art for artists, if it will be a resurgence um, in terms of uh, design, uh, I'm not speaking very clearly, but let me start over here. You know, the, the, in fashion, the conversation that I'm also hearing a lot about and we're talking a lot about now is sustainability and what does that mean? And there's yeah. 8 million different ways to sort of speak about um, sustainable fashion. Is it literally the fabric or is it just the length of time that a garment exists? When I think about the fashion of this era, um, and I remember when I first saw you speak, you were sort of talking about how you would buy like one coat and like that was your, if you were going to have it for a portrait, like that was your fancy coat. That is in a way hyper sustainable. Um, and then you would give it to your courtiers once you, once it became marked, because of course cleaning things was very difficult, you would then, once it, you know, sort of, you, it wasn't quite good enough for you to wear anymore, you would give it to your, your courtiers or to your ladies in waiting or, you know, and so things had a life and things would be chopped up and made right. into altar like cloths. Right, like if the one wife was beheaded, then, you know, you wouldn't exactly. just throw her clothes away. No. The other one would take it and they'd be so things. them away right. before the wife was even dead and gave them to your new, new well, yeah, wife, Anne Boleyn. You know, <laughs> and, and also, you know, that was a question of scarcity and, and, and supply and so on. But it's, it's an interesting mm. issue about sustainability and this let, let's keep things and keep Next using them and, and sharing them, you know. <laughs> but I, but I, want, I just wonder if, you know, as we sort of think about new designers and like how are designers innovating, especially in that space, it's interesting to think of how they'll look to techniques 
used in you know mm. the Renaissance time. Like if threads have still lasted enough till now to be able to save a you know a cut of a textile, what does that mean for fabrics used in designing next you know spring's collection? Mm. Hi, um, this is to the whole panel. I just had a question about whether you've noticed anything globally, because just, you know, in all over the world, like in other countries, you see a lot of brand consciousness still, and people want to wear everything from one brand. And I was just noticing, I went to an Indian wedding recently in Brooklyn, where they, you know, they wore very traditional clothes, but then they had these amazing gold sneakers, both the bride and the groom, and I thought that was the coolest thing. But you don't really see, I haven't seen much of that globally as much as you see in like the ad campaigns and the fashion magazines. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that whether that's also going to happen globally. Well, Rachel's just returned from Russia. So yeah. you <laughs> that's exotic. Well, I think it's, it's interesting that you um, see, you know, with, um, not to go again back to that Gasquier look where, you know, you have the sneakers and the frock coat, but I do think there is this kind of, that's a sort of way to bake in uh, these, from a sales perspective, things that, um, you know, the designers or the brands know, um, you know, are going to sell in places like Russia and, you know, in Asia, which are really, those are really the areas of the world that buy a lot of clothing. Um, and the products that tend to sell there are the very, like, logo-oriented clothing. And it's interesting that you see, like, and this is sort of what I was saying at the beginning, where the designers you see, you know, interpreting these kind of old master motifs into their work, it's happening with the most like modern forward thinking clothing because it's like you do see Gucci making like really fantastic sneakers and making really fantastic, you know, sweatshirts and like sweatsuits and that sort of thing. Um, so it is a way to kind of get that, um, you know, meet the two aesthetics. So like Alessandro gets what he wants, which is everyone to sort of like look like they've stepped out of an old master painting, but also the person who really wants to buy a Gucci sneaker to say like, hey, I can buy a Gucci sneaker can get that as well. And I think that mix that you're talking about um, between, you know, like old and new, quite literally, um, I see it in street style. If you look at street style photos from sort of around the world, um, we have a few on our site right now. I think we just ran uh, one from, I think it was Tokyo Fashion Week, and um, I don't know, all of them. And it's just, it's fascinating. And of course, it tends to sort of at least look like, skew a little bit toward more of the younger kids um, who are really keeping up with sort of like the trends and whatnot. But I think it's, hap I think it's happening all over. Even in, we just got a slideshow back from a photographer who went to Morocco. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a full mix. Any more questions? Well, uh, <laughs> well, in that case, um, well, your assignment is to go out onto the floor <laughs> and find two portraits. Um, well, thank you for coming. This has been really interesting, and you guys are fantastic. Um, and thanks for your perspectives on things. Right, and thank you. Um, I think, can we have a massive round of applause for Megan? <laughs> <laughs> um, jo thank you. And our panelists. <laughs> um, and Jopal, who are you wearing today, Jopal? Um, well, this is actually from a vintage shop in Florence. I bought it beside Palazzo Pitti, so it's both old mastery and, <laughs> and vintagey and sustainable. Um, yeah. What about you? What are you wearing today? God, I need you guys to say, what is, we say it is, we it's just vintage Lycopin. Yeah. Yes. Vintage yeah. Lycopin. Yeah, it's my yeah. boyfriend's aunt's blazer game. <laughs> sustainable. And sustainable fashion. Um, and I'm wearing a Dries Van Noten uh, jacket um, and a pair of vintage pants. Oh, so my shoes are actually made by a really great sustainable designer named Maureen Serre, um, who used to work for Balenciaga, which is not a very old masters oriented brand, but Maureen is very old masters oriented. And she collaborated with Melissa, who makes these rubber shoes. Um, it's a Brazilian brand uh, and made these little babouche slippers. Yeah, she's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, my boots are Jill Sander. Oh, nice. That's all. <laughs> since, <laughs> since, <laughs> since she came up. <laughs> Great. So that's all.
Thank you. Uh, now everybody can come look at each other's shoes. <laughs> Yeah, this is the moment where you turn to the right, turn to the left, see what everybody's wearing. Can you figure it out? Is it sustainable? Is it not sustainable? Thank you so much for coming and uh, come back again. Thank you.